if I crane my neck, I can just see Joe Biden way. So, and congrats to um, Connecticut, along with our hometown here in Pennsylvania for bringing Joe home. Anyway, you can see here the CME disclosures. I have really nothing to disclose other than I receive royalties from books I happen to write or edit. Here is the activity sign-in process, which I'll, um, a slide that I'll show later as well. The text code today is 16224. So today we're gonna to talk about evidence-based means of personalizing psychotherapy. In other words, how to create a new therapy for each patient. We do so by tailoring to the individual patient, but according to the generalities of the research evidence. In this way, we largely transcend the historical dichotomy between ideographic and nomothetic approaches. So here's a program description. We all know about the need to adapt or fit psychological treatment to the individual patient. It's been universally recognized from the beginning of modern psychotherapy. In fact, Freud himself introduced psychoanalytic psychotherapy as an alternative to the classical psychoanalysis. He was acutely aware that psychoanalysis proper lacked universal apathy, and he introduced the so-called copper uh, psychotherapy. Over the subsequent decades, hundreds of potential patient characteristics have been proposed as markers for using one type of style or one approach over another. However, it's only been within the last 10 or so years that this perennial quest for adapting psychotherapy to the entire patient, the transdiagnostic characteristics, has been fulfilled on sound research. In that regard, it's a very exciting time to be a psychotherapist. So in today's grand rounds, I will be providing integrative evidence-based methods for adapting or responding psychological treatments to our individual patients and their singular context and cultures. Specifically, I'm going to review the meta-analytic results and clinical practices of a recent interdivisional APA task force on transdiagnostic matching. In this case, APA is the American Psychological Association. Um, how to match to the entire person in ways that are research supported. This then will result in evidence-based relational re responsiveness, or if you prefer, treatment adaptations. By the end of 60 minutes, um, I believe you'll be able to accomplish these three learning objectives. You'll be able to describe three patient responsiveness dimensions that enhance treatment outcomes. That should not prove much of a task as I'll present eight, so you just do three. We'll identify how accommodating patient preferences enhances treatment outcomes, as that's one of the eight transdiagnostic uh, matching dimensions. And I'll just talk rapidly uh, about how to rapidly assess patient's stage of change for a particular disorder. Stage of change is one of those evidence-based methods of adapting or tailoring psychotherapy. But before you can adapt to the stage, you obviously need to quickly and accurately assess a patient's stage of change. Okay, let's jump in. So as I'm presenting these meta-analyses, and I promise this is a clinical grand rounds, not, not an intense research seminar, please do remember that I'm reviewing experimental studies. The vast majority of these studies were straight RCTs, randomized clinical trials, with the outcomes reported as D. That's Cohen's D, the effect size, or in a few cases, Hedges uh, G. And this we sometimes refer to as what works in particular. Over the last 20 years in a series of these interdivisional task force, we've been searching for the answers to two big questions. The first is to identify elements of the therapeutic relationship that work. 
In other words, what works in general for most patients? What should we be teaching? What should we be offering our patients in the relationship? The second question, which consumes me here today, is what are the effective methods to tailor, adapt, personalize therapy to the individual patient? Or in other words, what works in particular? So that's what we'll be discussing today. And we've done this, as I mentioned, multiple times. That's evidence-based relationships and responsiveness. The last task force, which I've chaired um, three times now, is sponsored by a number of organizations. Each time we update the meta-analyses, we add additional elements. In fact, it's become such a large undertaking that we can't cram it all into a single volume. So if you're looking for details, methodological details in particular, you can refer to the books. You can uh, refer to truncated articles based on those chapters and special issues of psychotherapy from the Journal of Clinical. And before NREP disappeared about six months ago, you could also look it up in SAMHSA's National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. So details are all available there, friends. So how did we decide what works? Well, quickly, uh, in these meta-analytic reviews, we examine the number of empirical studies, the consistency of the results emanating from those studies, the independence of the studies, ensuring that no one lab produced most of the results. Of course, we're interested in the strength or the magnitude of the effect since these were experimental studies in RCTs, the causal link is fairly clear. Uh, this is not correlational, whereas mostly the relationship research is purely associative or correlational. What I present today is causal. And finally, the ecological or external validity of the research. Now, I don't mean to re-traumatize you with statistics, but just a quick review of what a D means. Uh, this is Cohen's D, that's an effect size. Again, on occasion, you'll see Hedges G. For our purposes, they're virtually equivalent. So a D literally standing for difference. What's the difference between treatment A and treatment B? It's usually expressed as this effect size of D. In biomedical research, and particularly the behavioral sciences, a D of 0.8 is considered a large effect size. For instance, psychotherapy versus no psychotherapy typically produces a D of 0.85 to 0.9, depending upon the outcome variables. So that's a large, beneficial, quite positive effect. A 0.5 D or G is a medium effect and 0.2 is small. And of course, if the D, literally the difference between treatment A and treatment B is zero, there's no effect. So in the subsequent meta-analyses, please, um, just as a way of comparing the results, understanding their clinical impact, just take note of their D. Uh, virtually everything I'm going to present shows medium to large impacts. And that's why these are treatment adaptations or responsiveness that work. Right, so the historical way of conducting treatment matching or tailoring would be to the patient's disorder or diagnosis. Here's a comic uh, actually featuring a long term Dr. Marv Goldfried is a therapist where the patient comes in implicitly thinking or fantasizing I hope he treats the problem I have, where the therapist, Marv in this case, is likewise fantasizing. I hope she has the problem I treat. Unfortunately, at least in psychotherapy, this treatment match of method A to disorder Z has turned out quite disappointing um, for most disorders and most occasions. That's not to say we should ignore diagnosis or disorders, of course, but if you want to materially increase the effectiveness of psychotherapy, it's not matching to disorders, friends. 
it's matching to the entire person. And I'll show you how that's done. I frequently introduce this as what every clinician knows. It seems quite obvious for any half conscious clinician. No treatment will work for all patients. What works for one patient may not work for another. This is the law of individual differences, of variability or patient heterogeneity. In the psychotherapy research, it's encoded in Gordon Paul's 1967 iconic question, what treatment by whom is most effective for this individual with that specific problem? Only matching therapy to a disorder is incomplete and as we know, not always effective. Hence, we need to adapt, match, respond to the entire person, which I'm calling transdiagnostic features of the patient and their singular context. Another way of phrasing it, perhaps more negatively, is the lethality of one size fitting all. Now, part of the problem, both in clinical and research pursuits, is that this process of individualizing, personalizing treatment adaptations comes by a multitude of names. Some people call it treatment selection, which works, uh, except it obviously emphasizes treatment not other considerations like the therapeutic relationship and the like. My first clinical supervisor, the late Arnie Lazarus, liked to call this prescriptionism. I'm also quite fond of differential therapeutics. And in fact, 20 years ago, Al Francis, John Clarkin, and the late Sam Perry produced uh, two books called Differential Therapeutics in Psychiatry. You can also hear Treatment matching, tailoring what you do to your clothes, customizing what you do to your automobile. Uh, for the research nerds, we got aptitude by treatment interaction. It's actually a research design. So there's a patient aptitude, say reactance level, culture, stage of change, and you literally test it by a treatment, thus causing the interaction. In bold, you'll see two terms for this process individualizing and personalizing. Uh, in a bunch of focus groups here, we found both actual therapy patients and potential patients preferred these terms and intuitively knew what it meant. So um, for training purposes and for introducing this process to patients, I tend to use the word individualizing and personalizing. There's also matchmaking specificity factor the two terms on this slide in italics are those used most frequently in the research literature. In the humanistic and psychodynamic traditions, responsiveness tends to be most popular. In the CBT tradition, you'll see treatment adaptations. But by whatever name, friends, remember, the overall mandate for this process is to increase the efficacy and effectiveness of psychotherapy. So use whatever name, it's the process. So this is obviously an old idea, now come to evidence-based fruition. You can think about it in terms of when then, sort of as a conditional probability. When the client presents with this culture, this reactance level, this stage, this religion, then consider doing this. I'll say it again. Transdiagnostic features predominate, but it doesn't have to be an either or, it should be a both and. But the research here largely highlights the impact of the matching to transdiagnostic features. In this way, we match to the entire person, not only to diagnosis. In fact, we frequently call this what works for specific patients, different strokes for different folks. We're literally creating a new therapy for each patient. As I said at the outset, we're tailoring to the particulars of the individual, but according to the generalities of the research evidence. And this evidence has largely become available in the last 10 to 15 years. But it's an old idea. Going back to Hippocrates, we're here. The father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler, who in 1906 wrote, it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of disease a patient has. 
So at this point, I imagine you're all agreeing, of course, a different therapy for each patient. But tell us, how exactly, how in clinical work do you fit therapy to a patient in ways that we know work? Well, that's been exactly what we've been trying to do over the last 20 years in these series of three um, interdivisional and now interorganizational task forces. So here are six demonstrably effective means of adapting, tailoring, personalizing. We'll go through each, briefly hitting the research support, but then more, more importantly, focusing on the clinical work. So notice each of these are transdiagnostic patient features or characteristics, if you like. So the first is reactance level. N Similar to, but not identical to resistance. Resistance tends to be situation specific. It is a state. By contrast, a patient's reactance level is a trait. It's on a normally distributed or Gaussian curve. Some people are low, most people are average, and then some people are high. The reactance trait refers to being easily provoked and responding oppositionally to external demands. So low reactants would be quite compliant patients in the pathological extreme. They'd be uh, probably dependent personality disorder. Most patients in the middle, and then on the high reactants, you would have compliant, usually an externalizing, acting out, antisocial or sociopathic behavior. Well, we know that exists, but so what? The so what is that reactance level is a powerful marker for the level of directiveness. To that ancient question of how directive of a therapist are you? The best answer, I believe, well, at least the best evidence-based answer is it depends. It depends upon the reactance level of the patient. So this meta-analysis in our work, uh, led by Larry Butler, found 13 controlled studies with over 1,200 patients revealing a large effect size for matching therapist directiveness to patient reactants. Notice the D of 0.78 there. Specifically, high reactance patients benefit more from emphasizing their self-control, minimal direction, and if you're clinically and ethically inclined, paradoxical interventions. Paradoxical interventions work better with high reactants than low reactance patients. So notice, you're still leading, but in this case, you're probably leading from the back of the boat. By contrast, with low reactance patients, you make more impressive progress by leading from the front of the boat, because indeed, they benefit more from therapist directiveness and explicit guidance. How directive to be? It depends on the patient's reactance level. And notice that DIA.78, this is a powerful effect. As is matching to the patient's culture, specifically their race and ethnicity. This meta-analysis found 99 studies, over 13,000 patients, which evaluated the impact of culturally adaptive therapies versus traditional or non-adaptive therapies. So a typical study would get 40 depressed patients. 20 of the patients, let's say they were depressed, would receive um, just non-adaptive CBT for 12 or 16 sessions, and the other 20 patients would random, randomize, would receive 20 sessions of CBT that has been culturally adapted to their race or ethnicity. What happens? both at the end of treatment and six months later, you find a medium effect size of 0 0.50 in favor of clients receiving their culturally adaptive treatments. In other words, cultural fit is just not an ethical matter. It is an evidence-based practice. It obviously improves effectiveness, however defined. So that largely begs the question, well, then what exactly are you adapting to? So in these 99 studies, the most frequent methods of adaptation were adapting to the client's preferred language, incorporating cultural content and values, matching to therapists of similar ethnicity, 
or and or addressing the client's context, such as systemic racism. This improves care. You can see here additional elements of culturally adaptive treatments. Not surprisingly, the single most effective adaptation was to the client's preferred language. If you're literally not understanding each other, not on the same page, that will prove a problem. Also good news from a subsequent analysis of those 99 studies, the more cultural adaptations you employ, the larger the effect size. So 0.5, of course, is the average effect size, typically using one or two adaptations. If you begin to use multiple elements, you then increase incrementally the sets of your patients. So the third transdiagnostic matching or personalizing method that works is preferences, something I've been particularly interested in in the last five or 10 years. And I confess, I was perhaps a little naive beginning clinical training some 40, 45 years ago into believing that patients sort of wanted the same thing. Not in what they sought as their treatment goal, but in the how to reach that treatment goal. Over several decades of practice, my naivete has become immediately apparent. For example, uh, research indicates wide variations in client preferences, say in level of structure. So it's just one item from the CNIP, that's the Cooper Norcross Inventory of Preferences. Simply asking patients, I would like my therapist to allow the therapy to be unstructured or give structure to the therapy. Again, the rule of patient variability. People have strong individual differences in not only the goals of therapy, but how to secure those goals. Here's another one. I'd like the therapist to focus on my future, focus on my past. Looks like almost like a perfect normal curve. By ignoring preferences, patient preferences, on the journey, on how psychotherapy may best be fit to them, we are missing quite a lot. This meta-analysis in the book by Josh Swift, uh, Jennifer Callahan, Mick Cooper, found 51 randomized clinical trials encompassing more than 16,000 psychotherapy patients. And I should have said earlier, to be included, all these patients and studies had to be psychotherapy. Compared the outcomes of clients matched versus non-matched to preferences. Find a modest a effect size of 0.28 in favor of clients matched to the treatment role or therapist preferences. In fact, we know this effect size of 0.28 is a systematic underestimation of the actual impact in clinical work because the studies just asked about preferences. Even if the patient didn't have a strong preference, they were included. The moment you start asking, as I would recommend, about strong preferences, you get even a bigger effect size. But let's not oversell it. You will achieve at least a modest increase in improvement for all patients receiving their preferences when clinically and ethically indicated. But wait. There's more. In 28 studies, those patients not receiving their preferences were twice, almost twice as likely to drop out. So that's a huge impact. So think about that. We know the average dropout rates for private, I'm, I'm sorry, for public health clinics, probably between 30 and 34 percent, according to the meta-analyses. Thankfully, the dropout rate is much lower in private practices, but in public clinics, it can get quite high. Imagine by simply accommodating patients' immediate strong preferences, you drop, you, you decrease the dropout by half. That's quite impressive. By the way, just a note here, in soliciting client preferences, please inquire what they desire, but also what they despised. Uh, the what a patient might despise or fear in psychotherapy proves to be valuable prognostic and diagnostic information. 
Uh, in the early years, it was just pretty much, what do you want? We realize sometimes it has more to do avoiding what the patient dislikes. Because there weren't very good instruments, by the way, we went and developed an inventory of preferences, a brief, reliable, multidimensional scale. By the way, you can't buy this. Uh, it's free in the public domain, licensed under Creative Commons. I don't use it for clinical um, concerns, but if you're doing a research study, uh, it might prove useful. And you may notice the uh, four subscales uh, map very nicely on to what I've been presenting today. The level of directedness, the degree of emotional intensity, a past versus present orientation, support versus challenge. By the way, it's normed on U.S. and U.K. adults. Um, but frankly, in clinical practice, I ask open-ended questions. After you've established treatment goals, I simply say something like, I've been doing psychotherapy and psychotherapy research for 40 years. If I've learned anything, it's that I need to individualize or personalize therapy to you. While well, I'm an expert on therapy, you're more of an expert on you. In order to obtain your goals, whatever they are, um, do you have any strong preferences for how therapy might operate? Do you have any strong dislikes or fears I should also know about? That's it. The assessment should take two or three minutes. It increases the alliance. It increases engagement. And yes, as you've seen, it increases outcome itself. By the way, if you're just looking to download the CNIP, you can simply go to that website or just shoot Mick Cooper or me an email. I'm asked frequently, why does preference accommodation work so powerfully? The research co consistently points to three uh, possibilities and probably the confluence of the three. First is simply according a patient choice. Um, when I give workshops on this, I usually ask, the mental health or more broadly health practitioners to think back to the last three health appointments that they've had. An internist, um, OBGYN, if you see a neurologist, a rheumatologist, uh, if you have children and you've been to your pediatrician, in how many of those recent healthcare appointments where you asked for an important choice in the way your care was rendered. Yeah, me too, hardly ever. About 10% of you will raise your hand and say, at least in one of those, you were asked for an important treatment choice. The rest of us, not so much. It's pretty much, here's how we deliver it, take it. So the mere act of choice is empowering, supportive, collaborative, everything we know about good psychotherapy. A second reason that preferences works is probably because the match, the patient knows themselves. And be prepared here, friends, for a blizzard of different answers. Uh, for a while, I even kept a long list of these. Um, but virtually every time, I'm impressed uh, by what people might come up with. And third, as I alluded to a few moments ago, simply assessing preferences enhances the alliance. In fact, we've done a couple studies with a huge HMO on the West Coast, whose name I cannot reveal, but there's really only one huge HMO on the West Coast, in which we find that assessing strong preferences in the intake call to their intake center for behavioral health increase their satisfaction and increase by about 20 to 25 percent the people who actually showed for the first appointment. That was a product of simply assessing their strong preferences. Even if we did match it, we got an even bigger bump when we assessed their, and I'm sorry, when we assessed and then matched their preferences. And by the way, you're really overwhelmed uh, by these requests. Um, occasionally at this point, someone's thinking or raises a hand or introduces me and says, John, you're opening up Pandora's box. 
people are going to start asking for all kinds of therapist uh, characteristics that we can't match. Um, that's not the case. Only 12% of thousands of patients who called in and were assessed for strong preferences at this uh, HMO on the West Coast requested a particular therapist characteristic. Only 12%. And we could almost always clinically defend and understand that. For example, women recently in interpersonally violent relationships who said they may be more comfortable with a woman. So you're not likely to be overwhelmed with specific requests, but you do then increase the effectiveness of therapy by virtue of choice, match, and alliance. Another transdiagnostic feature, largely ignored uh, by most of us in truth, is the patient's religion and spirituality. Here, Josh Hook and colleagues identified 97 RCTs involving some 7,000 patients on religious, spiritual, accommodative psychotherapies versus non-accommodating therapies. So again, someone, you may have 40 anxious patients, uh, 20 of them randomly selected, get um, 16 sessions, of a solution focus or psychodynamic therapy, and then the other 20 get the same therapy with some religious accommodative content. When you look at these studies at first blush, you find patients receiving their religious spiritual accommodative treatments show greater improvement in both psychological and spiritual outcomes. But if we dig a little deeper into dismantling designs, in which all treatment conditions shared the same orientation and duration, you don't find any differences in mental health outcomes between clients with a spiritual a religious spiritual accommodation and those without. Now, this is actually quite reassuring news. If patients would like you and you feel comfortable and capable of adding some religious spiritual content into the session as led by the patient, then you, on average, are going to achieve the same level of treatment success. But also notice, you will achieve even greater spiritual outcomes as reported by patients. Some of those outcomes could be feeling closer to God, uh, feeling better connected, feeling that their psychotherapy involved their entire selves, including their spiritual commitments. So religion, spiritual accommodative therapies obviously work, and you don't need to be an expert on various religions. You do need to show cultural humility and an openness to engage with the patient. The next treatment adaptation that we know works is the stages of change. Most of you are probably familiar with this. And for the last 40 some years, I can't go anywhere without talking about them. So when I say stages of change, I mean for a particular disorder or goal, patients begin in pre-contemplation, or as we mental health professionals have, have um, inadvisably called it, denial, into contemplation, thinking about it, but not ready yet, into preparation, taking baby steps, into zoom, zoom action, into maintenance. Well, that's, of course, for a single attempt, but we know with virtually all of our patients, there's multiple attempts until there's final termination, termination of that treatment episode or even ideally termination of the diagnosis or disorder. People frequently forget that the stages of change were specifically designed to personalize or individualize treatments. This is called stage matching. When people think about the stages, they say, yeah, I know that stuff, but they forget what the overarching goal of the stages of change, fit therapy to the patient. In order to do that, we need to quickly assess the stages and do remember even though I make this mistake myself, 
It's stage of change for a particular problem. It is problem or goal specific. So I may talk about pre-contemplators, but it'd be better to say a person in pre-contemplation for this problem. For our multi-disordered patients, they are assuredly in a multitude of stages. In clinical work, we could simply ask, do you believe you currently have a problem with whatever, eating disorders, depression, anxiety? If they say yes, then by definition, they'll be in contemplation, preparation, or action stage as they acknowledge the problem. If they say no, then they are, again, by definition, in pre-contemplation or maintenance. So you only need to ask two questions, the first one, then the follow-up. So if they reply yes, then you can say, well, when do you plan to change it? Someday, I'm working on it, characterizes them as contemplation in the next few weeks, preparation, right now. By the way, beginners frequently make the mistake of conflating being in the action stage for receiving psychotherapy with being in the action stage for problem resolution. They may be in treatment, but to paraphrase Anna Freud, one of the best defenses we've ever encountered is someone running to psychotherapy and thinking about changing for years. If the patient says, no, I don't have a problem with that, we'll respectfully ask what leads you to say that. They'll say, because it's either not a problem for me, though it may be a problem for my spouse or the judge or my boss, or because they believe they've already changed it. Asking these series of quick questions about the major or sole disorder correctly places someone in their stage of change about 95% of the time. So for clinical work, please don't use any of our measures or decision trees. This works. And in fact, when you start thinking in terms of patient readiness, stages of change, you frequently don't need to ask it because the patient's deliberate. So what's a meta-analysis show? Actually, there's a couple here. A meta-analysis of 47 studies reveals a large effect size, indeed, between 0.7 and 0.8 for different change processes in different stages. That's the stage matching. Do different things when patients are in different stages. In the meta-analysis specifically uh, for the book by Paul Krebs, Jim Prochaska, and myself, stages reliably predict psychotherapy outcomes. That's in 76 studies, that's K, the number of studies, and with some 21,000 patients. That's not surprising. You want better, quicker results? Get someone in preparation and action stage. Want someone that's going to be slower or worse results? Start with someone in pre-contemplation. So when embedded in the stages of change, disparate systems of psychotherapy are complementary, not contradictory. Which system of psychotherapy works best? What's the patient's stage of change? That's the mandate for stage matching. If you're of certain age, by the way, the left side of this slide is the so-called awareness or insight-oriented therapies. Whereas on the right-hand side of the slide, these are the so-called action CBT therapies. They are complementary, not contradictory. In fact, uh, just this morning, I had a conversation with a colleague who asked me, well, what did CBT therapists do when patients presented in pre-contemplation and contemplation? I said, that's a great question. Uh, I said, they could try to negotiate treatment goals for a patient who didn't think he or she had the problem, uh, or they could say, well, I guess you're not ready yet. Luckily, motivational interviewing which, of course, is really operationalized, person-centered, or Rogerian therapy, has come to the rescue. And now my CBT colleagues have person-centered methods to help people move into the preparation and action stage. Of course, the other mismatch are people that are largely doing insight and awareness therapies. Uh, And then when patients are in action and maintenance, They wish them well, or they believe it's going to be automatic, which we certainly know from decades of psychotherapy research, it is not. 
So not only can you stage match types of therapy, change processes, and treatment methods, but we also strongly advocate for stage matching your optimal therapeutic relationship because that too will vary with the stage of change. So when you have a patient in pre-contemplation, you are like a nurturing parent joining with a defensive youngster, both drawn to independence and anxious about it. So you're showing unconditional support, though not normalizing or accepting destructive behavior. Once the client moves into contemplation, then you become the Socratic teacher. And by that, I'm not referring to straight cognitive interventions. I'm talking about cognitive, motivational, and affective work. Read Socratic dialogues. Once into action, the therapist is more like an experienced coach. Actually, I prefer the term fishing guide here, but most people don't fish. But the experienced coach is more supportive, giving methods, teaching skills. And finally, when the patient graduates into maintenance, you're spending less time on the problem, trying to consult with them about relapse prevention, generalization, maintenance strategies in general. So let's also talk about coping style. Those of you who work with children have known for decades um, about treatment selection for internalizing versus externalizing disorder. This has now been extended to adult patients. And while we can define coping style in numerous ways, let's talk about it at least for the purposes of this meta-analysis as externalizing versus internalizing disorders. Right, so if we reapply it to kids, your externalizer is, you know, the seven-year-old ADHD boy who's just uh, <coughs> ruined your office in five minutes, or the classical stereotype internalizing disorder will be a reticent, quiet, withdrawn ten-year-old girl. We now know this meta-analysis is based on adult studies only. That you get a medium effect size for matching therapist method to patient coping style, specifically externalizing versus internalizing. Which therapy works better? Not only does it depend upon the stage of change, but also on the coping style. Interpersonal and insight-oriented therapies are demonstrably more effective among internalizing patients. Thanks, Freud patients. In small contrast, symptom focus and skill building treatments are demonstrably more effective among externalizing patients. Think in ADHD, but now apply that to adults. And you also notice the externalizing internalizing disorder certainly does match somewhat onto diagnoses. So here's another area we can find diagnoses to provide important clues and potential matching or responsiveness methods. So they're the six friends that demonstrably work. But there's also three additional ones that are promising but insufficient research to judge. We've included them in the book, in the meta-analyses, but they're not there yet. Um, and you'll see that in a few moments. But I fully expect when we do the next edition of the book, we do it in 10-year intervals, they'll be there. So attachment uh, style. The emotional bonds originating between caregivers and children. Um, we know the attachment styles vary by researcher and by age, but generally and, and specifically for meta-analytic research, we divide the attachment styles into secure, insecure, anxious, and insecure avoidance. They're moderately stable, cross-situational styles, you know, they're traits. I must confess, every time I go into this literature, the measurement is a mess. But it's obviously important and obviously impressive, at least the early work. This is a meta-analysis by Ken Levy at Penn State. In 36 studies, he found the relationship between attachment security and treatment outcome was the 0.35. That is, patients better attached as a beginning therapy likely to have better treatment outcomes. No big whoop there, you would predict that. But it's comforting 
that research has supported clinical reality. More impressive is the meta-analysis on the relationship between in-treatment improvement in attachment security of the patient and eventual outcome. That's a DIA 0.32. So for your insecure patients, if you work and successfully improve their attachment security, their outcomes augur better. The problem is we don't have good randomized clinical trials in this area yet. This is so far largely correlational. But that research will be coming, I'm sure. The same can be said for gender identity and sexual orientation. There's lots of exciting work in both areas, especially gay affirmative, gender nonconforming, or non-binary treatment. In all the studies, I shouldn't say that, in the vast majority of studies, it's very clear that patients benefit pre- to post-therapy in these forms of treatment. But there's practically no randomized clinical trials attesting to their effectiveness compared to another treatment. And that would be the ASTA test for showing if saying a gay affirmative therapy would work better. So this is a huge area for future research. As long as it's good randomized clinical trial, it would be on the cutting edge. So I'm occasionally asked, and I'm trying to empathically anticipate a few questions here. Well, how about just routinely matching the therapist-patient dyad then on some of these transdiagnostic features? Say gender, ethnicity, and religion, spirituality. And we've been looking for these robust effects for the last 30 years and frankly have not found them. Until it occurred to us, and when I say us, the collective uh, discipline of psychotherapy research, that this would actually be culturally insensitive to routinely match people on this, unless the client expresses strong preference. When the patient expresses a strong preference and you believe it's clinically and ethically indicated to do so, then you see these powerful differences. But simply saying to someone, well, you're a woman, so you're going to do better with a woman or let's match the Jew with the Jewish therapist. That is culturally insensitive. I frequently use um, my own example. I am in terms of racial identification about one quarter Cherokee Indian, but I, my ethnicity was a white kid raised outside of Philadelphia. So if someone were to try to match me to a Cherokee therapist, would just be a terrible mismatch and a misconstrual of who I am. So when patients express a strong preference, you will experience typically a quite robust improvement in immediate engagement and long-term outcome. But routinely doing it shows virtually no effect. At this point, too, some of you are wondering, well, that's it? You have six demonstrably effective and three or four promising? How do we know there's others out there? We haven't completed our search, nor have we exhausted the treatment adaptations. There are probable examples that I mentioned, attachment, gender identity. I believe functional impairment shows promise. But we can't meta-analyze research that doesn't exist. So there's simply insufficient research to draw conclusions at this juncture. But I would add that six demonstrably effective and three promising are nine transdiagnostic features that one can consider, assess, and potentially match. And in fact, if I'm addressing any students out there, please don't try to do all nine. Work with your supervisor to pick one or two of these transdiagnostic matching features that you would be comfortable assessing, then routinely matching, Speak with your supervisor, get comfortable, and then gradually build on all of these. Uh, occasionally, trainees, including my own, if I'm not careful, will go OCD on me and try to simultaneously assess and match all of these. Ironically, they thereby lose the very therapeutic relationship they were seeking to cultivate. So go slow, take a few, get competent, and then move on. 
So how about some limitations to what I presented? As I've emphasized, these meta-analytic reviews provide causal conclusions. If you match in this way, these are the likely effects. But there is the possibility of investigator allegiance. That is, as in many randomized clinical trials, the researchers may have been inclined to find stuff. And the second primary limitation is the overlap between some of these transdiagnostic dimensions. For example, stages and reactants. Stages are a state, reactants is a trait, and yet the correlation between the pre-contemplation state and reactants as a trait is about 0.3. Or to take another example, a patient's culture is likely to strongly influence their cultural preferences, and yet I presented these as distinct. So please bear those in mind. So amid this turnt, this uh, tsunami of meta-analytic stats, friends, let's take a breath and take a mindful moment to consider the clinical implications. Adapting psychotherapy to the entire person in these ways improves success and decreases dropouts. And in fact, as you've just seen, the power of this responsiveness exceeds that associated with matching treatment method A for disorder Z. This is not John's opinion. This is not clinical lore. This is now established fact. In fact, let's get geeky and look at a few more uh, graphs. So the typical effect size of one treatment versus the other is zero, right? This is the dodo bird verdict, controversial as it is. But the overwhelming research shows when you control for the researcher's allegiance, it's pretty much close to zero. Now, if that were the case here, you would have two overlapping uh, curves. You wouldn't see any difference. That would be a D of zero. In those fairly rare occasions when there is a difference, the average effect size is 0.2 between treatment A and treatment B. Let's take the example, for example, uh, take the example of uh, treatment of PTSD, something I've spent a fair amount of time doing and writing about. Some form of exposure therapy seems to produce better results. So that could be prolonged exposure with response prevention, EMDR, cognitive processing, narrative exposure, uh, CBT, trauma focus, okay? All those. But the difference in that so-called frontline treatment is about a D of point two. So by all means, consider adding some form of exposure to treatment for PTSD you'll get a difference like that. However, when you implement the responsiveness and adaptations that I presented today, the six that demonstrably work, you get effect sizes like this, 0.5 and 0.8. So you really want to make a difference? Sure. Match to a particular, a treatment method to a particular disorder, but far better match your particular style or treatment method to patient transdiagnostic features. So if you're, if you're an optometrist or ophthalmologist, which looks clear, which looks like it's going to make a difference? Right there, friends, has way more clinical impact. So let's come full circle. If you're truly following the research evidence, and you're a scholar practitioner, you're going to customize the therapy. But honestly, beyond a bunch of useful phrases and encouraging, like create a new therapy for each patient, it's really only been in the last decade or two that we can say we know how to do it. So call it personalized psychotherapy, quite similar to the premise of precision medic, uh, medicine. Sometimes it's predicated on the patient's disorder or diagnosis, but always predicated on the patient's transdiagnostic characteristics. 
Which therapy works best? It depends. Depends in particular on the client. I'll say for the third and final time, it's both diagnostic and transdiagnostic features. So we do know what works. Decades of research and experience converge. Responsiveness works. Without getting too geeky, these effect sizes, these and G's, do concrete, concretely translate into healthier and happier patients. And to repeat, this interpersonal responsiveness, or if you prefer treatment adaptations or personalizing, makes substantial and consistent contributions to outcomes independent of the treatment type. As a result, in practice, we need to adapt treatment to patient features in these ways shown to enhance outcome. We need to routinely monitor patients' responses to both the relationship and ongoing treatment and take the both-end approach. It's both treatment methods and relationships tailored to the patient that are likely to generate the best outcome. And I know many of the people watching today are either trainees or trainers and supervisors. Please provide explicit and competence-based training in these transdiagnostic adaptations. We need to translate well-intended slogans into competence-based training. Or, as Aristotle put it, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So when we do, when we translate the slogan into clinical practices that personalize psychotherapy, then we will reclaim the psych in psychotherapy. We will transcend this limited and unfortunately divisive diagnosis-only approach to evidence-based practice. We'll reestablish the primacy of responsiveness in clinical work. We'll embrace individual differences in the reality that patients respond differently. And most importantly, most importantly, we'll conduct psychotherapy even more effectively, Frank. There again is the activity signing code 16 2024. And now I look forward to chat, chatting with you and entertaining questions. Doctor, uh, so Peter, Peter uh, Sugarman had a question. I can, let me see if I can get him unmuted. Um, just give me a moment. Peter Sugarman? Yep, I'm here. Go ahead. You're the, you have okay, the floor. Yeah. Hi. Um, that was um, very informative. I um, consider myself a therapist and fairly flexible, but it's, it's um, nice to hear formal words as to what methods to use to individualize therapy. My, my question has to do with APA guidelines uh, or other guidelines uh, where that comes into your choice of, of therapy, um, you know, how, how, how much you stick to that. And my second question has to do with whether you have any comments about the dilemma we face discharging patients to group-based programs, especially when patients have explicit preferences for individual therapy. Uh, well, thank you for your uh, kind words. Let me take the second question first. Um, I've been involved in several research studies and then controversial areas where patients are routinely and automatically sent uh, to group therapy. I, I should provide some context here. I'm, I'm a big fan of group therapy. But when patients have strong preferences... And I'll just not say modest preferences, strong verbalized preferences for individual psychotherapy. That's the treatment they should receive, at least as an adjunct or in addition to group therapy. Otherwise, you know you're sending them to less than optimal treatment that is not going to proceed well. Uh, and since I also consult to HMOs and community mental health centers, 
I know someone's going to scream. Well, then, you know, hire seven more therapists, John. What the hell are we going to do? We, we don't have the ability to do it. Fair enough. But then at least admit that you are not providing people their strong preferences. You are increasing dropouts prematurely, and you're probably just, and, and there hasn't been sufficient research, so this is just a clinical impression, the second part, and you're probably just increasing rehospitalizations, which we all know prove way more expensive than providing some outpatient psychotherapy. So I always say group plus an occasional individual in most patients can be satisfied, and you're meeting them where they are when they have such strong preferences. Uh, as to the first question, um, so I'm routinely consulted uh, by both APAs on how to incorporate this stuff. Um, if you're doing a disorder-only treatment guideline, then the authors of that report keep saying, well, where's the evidence for our diagnosis alone that any of the treatment adaptations work? And I say, well, that's, that makes no sense. These are transdiagnostic. And they say, yes, but there's only two studies on depression, so that's not enough research. And I say, so are you telling me for, well, let's, let's just take a number and say, for the 40 major disorders, I need to have 10 studies for each of these? That's never going to happen. And they say, well, we're disorder-specific. So the American Psychiatric Association promises on the next iteration of their diagnosis-specific treatment guidelines to make mention of this with the caveat it's not disorder-specific, nor is it supposed to be. And APA's uh, next treatment guidelines will actually be a transdiagnostic guideline. So we're certainly making progress there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Norcross. This is Laura Saunders. Hey, Laura. How are you? I'm fine, and I, um, I'm glad you made it. I, I've been here. I just have a little techno technological issue, um, so I was supposed to do your introduction, so I do apologize for that, but I do want to share what an amazing influence you were in uh, sending me to the field of clinical psychology, and this is just amazing, amazing um, presentation that I think is really thought provoking uh, hey, for a lot of us. You? So I appreciate what? it. Can somebody take this tech out? Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, so thank you, Laura. You know, what uh, I mean? you know it's. You mean? Yeah. Uh, we have some ambient noise here. It's not that from my, sounds, my end, thankfully. Well, that sounds far more interesting than my response, Laura. Um, uh, anyway, what I was going to say, when you have talented and motivated students, it's quite easy to help propel them on. And I know people uh, listening to this grand rounds are probably nodding and saying yes. Um, when the student is that talented, it's both easy and a pleasure to watch them go off and make everyone proud and improve the world. So... Thank you, Dr. Norcross. Bill, are there any other questions out there? Because I can't see them on my screen. No, I, I don't see any more questions. I just checked. Uh, it seems to be the last one. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that was that was the question. So, and that was my ambient noise. Sorry, I had someone come to my office. <laughs> had to shoo them away. Well, Laura, Bill, someone has to say, so thank you. Uh, well, I... <laughs> and that's it. So I, we, do, we, we do appreciate your time. I wish this was a different era and that you were able to be in, uh, in Hartford in person. I know it's not quite the same as Scranton because um, I spent a, an amazing four years there, but um, we certainly appreciate your, your time and your sharing your expertise with us. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, perhaps I'll see you up there one of these years in person again.
So thanks I'm all. I'm always happy to go.